Straight Ahead on Law and Crime Daily. A prosecutor goes off for having to dismiss dozens of cases after appeals courts rule in favor of an NFL owner caught in a sex sting. Rich guys from a local country club lined up to receive sex acts. Also, calls for transparency after a grand jury fails to agree on charges over the death of Breonna Taylor. Release the transcript. Release the transcript. We unravel the criticism. Plus, a defendant heads to trial Monday in the killings of his parents. Why does he want the death penalty even though the state wants him alive? And Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg receives a first-time honor for an American woman. Law and Crime Daily covers courts from coast to coast. And welcome everybody to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Aaron Keller along with Brian Buckmeyer and Terry Austin. Former Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg lies in state at the United States Capitol. She's the first woman and the first member of the Jewish faith to have ever received the honor. Ginsburg died of pancreatic cancer after serving on the high court for 27 years. Ginsburg joined narrow majorities to uphold the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act and to legalize same-sex marriage in all 50 states. More fallout now from the police killing of Breonna Taylor. Police have arrested 26-year-old Lorenzo Johnson on charges he shot two police officers during a protest related to grand jury's decision not to indict several other police officers involved with the raid which ended with Taylor's death. Johnson faces two counts of assaulting a police officer and 14 counts of wanton endangerment of a police officer. Meanwhile, the sole officer indicted in connection with the raid on Breonna Taylor's apartment is out on bond. Former detective Brett Hankinson posted a $15,000 bond and walked out of jail 32 minutes after he walked in. Hankinson is charged with wanton endangerment for blindly shooting into other apartments near Breonna Taylor's. His attorney says the evidence does not support the charges. The charges Hankinson faces are indirectly related to Taylor's death, of course. No officer has been charged directly with killing her. Grand jury proceedings are typically secret, but the transcripts can sometimes be released. An attorney for Breonna Taylor's family wants to know exactly what evidence prosecutors presented to the grand jury and is demanding transparency. Did he tell them about the 12 neighbors that Sam Aguilar's office interviewed and recorded that lived in close proximity of Breonna's apartment that all said they did not hear the police knock and announce their presence? Mm -hmm. Did he let the cops who shot over 30 rounds of bullets in Brianna's apartment, one from outside the apartment shooting recklessly and blindly, and the others who shot bullets into her body, did he allow them to testify before the grand jury? Did he talk about them sending the ambulance away mm. before they executed this no not one, violating their own policies and procedures, mm. knowing that these no not warrants are dangerous? Well, if he didn't present these things to the grand jury, what kind of sham grand jury proceeding was this? Yeah. It's not just attorneys, but relatives of Breonna Taylor who are demanding more information. Terry Austin has their reaction for us. Terry? Aaron, Breonna Taylor's family said they're angry, not only with the decision, but because they weren't informed of the decision before the public knew. Taylor's mother was actually too upset to speak, but her sister spoke on her behalf while wearing Taylor's EMT jacket. Taylor's family released these butterflies in her honor. They say they're heartbroken, devastated, outraged, and confused. I never had faith in Daniel Cameron to begin with. Amen. I knew he was too inexperienced to deal with a job of this caliber. Mm. Mm. I knew he had already chosen to be on the wrong side of the law. Mm. The moment he wanted to, the grand jury to make the decision, what I had hoped is that he knew he had the power to do the right thing, mm -hmm. that he had the power to start the healing of this city, that he had the power to help men over 400 years of oppression. Mm. Okay. What he helped me realize is that it will always be us against them. Mm. That we are never safe when it comes to them. Mm. Maddenly, in an email, called us animals and thugs. It's clear that that is the way that they will always see us. 
And now to Brian Buckmeyer with increasing frustration from the community you see banding together there for answers. Brian. Aaron, it's a club no parent wants to be a part of, but they stand strong together. Family members of the victims of police brutality are coming together to support Breonna Taylor's family. Jacob Blake, who was shot seven times by a police officer in Kenosha, Wisconsin, his family says he's unable to walk, but is hoping he'll be able to make a full recovery. His father traveled to Louisville to call for justice. We will not be moved. That drive meant nothing to me. Hey. Because I knew I had to be here. Mm -hmm. I knew I had to be here, standing next to my fraternity member. Mm. We didn't choose this fraternity. Mm -hmm. This fraternity chose us. Well. Mm. When it's your child, mm. you can't fathom the emotions that you go through every night. Mm. You hear them talking to you. They're not there, and you hear them talking to you. Analysis now, Brian, I'm an advocate for transparency in cases like this, too. I want to see the transcripts. I want to see exactly what legal arguments the attorney general presented, what evidence was presented, and try to get a sense of why this decision came out this way. Exactly. And I think everyone is in the same boat and that I think for a case like this should happen. Of course, the large majority of grand jury indictments and cases are secretive and there's a purpose for that. But when you look at what the AG said and how this case came out, I think there needs to be some oversight here. Terry, are you in agreement? I'm in full agreement. I think when you have something like this where there are actually no charges against Breonna Taylor, all of these social protests, all of these people are talking about the fact, you know, say her name, and you come out with an indictment. They actually knew there was going to be a problem. They got the city ready, and they knew that they needed to make an indictment as it related to her, and yet they did not. The transcripts might give us some answers as to exactly how this case was presented and give us perhaps some confidence or less confidence in how it rolled out. Let's go to an update now in the case of the teen accused of traveling to Wisconsin and shooting protesters in Kenosha. Kyle Rittenhouse killed two people and wounded a third during protests surrounding the police shooting of Jacob Blake. His attorneys are now fighting his extradition from his home state of Illinois to Wisconsin. Rittenhouse could face life in prison if convicted on the most serious charges he faces in Wisconsin. Rittenhouse's attorneys are characterizing him as a patriot who exercised his right to bear arms during civil unrest and who protected himself when he faced danger. Others see Rittenhouse as a domestic terrorist who incited the protesters. That's according to Associated Press reports. Legal criticism is building up against the Attorney General's interpretation of the law in the Breonna Taylor case we've been talking about, and we'll explain that after the break. And later on, a Florida prosecutor goes off after being basically forced to drop charges against scores of defendants, all because of legal maneuvers by New England Patriots owner Robert Kraft. Law & Crime Daily will be right back. A criticism surrounding the Kentucky Attorney General's announcement that he believed the police were justified when shooting and killing Breonna Taylor. Here's how the AG laid out his reasoning when announcing a grand jury's refusal to indict the officers involved. While there are six possible homicide charges under Kentucky law, these charges are not applicable to the facts before us because our investigation showed and the grand jury agreed that Mattingly and Cosgrove were justified in the return of deadly fire after having been fired upon by Kenneth Walker. Let me state that again. According to Kentucky law, the use of force by Mattingly and Cosgrove was justified to protect themselves. This justification bars us from pursuing criminal charges in Ms. Breonna Taylor's death. An attorney for Breonna Taylor's family is questioning how Kentucky's self-defense law was applied to the two officers who fired shots but who were not indicted. And I know that you don't have the right to use the defense of self-defense when you injure or kill an innocent third party. Yes, mm. And what we know from Sergeant Mattingly's own testimony to the Public Integrity Unit is that he saw that Breonna Taylor was unarmed. Yes. Yeah. His own testimony, he saw Breonna Taylor was unarmed. And then you made a lot of it, you put a lot of attention on the bullet, that the, the fatal, the fatal shot to Breonna Taylor being made by Miles Cosgrove. 
if he wasn't able to see Breonna Taylor, to also see that she was unarmed, then he also was firing just as recklessly as Brett Hankinson, and he deserves to be here charged with one murder of Breonna Taylor. If he didn't see her, he didn't have target acquisition, he deserves to be charged right now. So don't tell us that the grand jury made this determination if it was truly your determination. Answer that question head on. Was it your office's decision or was it the grand jury's decision? Release the transcript. Mm. Mm. A Rutgers Law School professor shared similar sentiments on Twitter saying the Kentucky Attorney General botched the law when the AG said the officers who shot at Taylor acted in self-defense. Under the Kentucky Penal Code, self-defense is unavailable as a justification in a prosecution for an offense involving wantonness or recklessness towards innocent persons, the professor tweeted. Even if two of the officers were justified in defending themselves against Walker, Taylor's boyfriend, they may have wantonly or recklessly injured or risked injury to Taylor. If the AG believes that the officers did not wantonly or recklessly injure or risk injury to Taylor, then he should explain why not. His legal rationale is flat out incorrect. Brian Buckmeyer, this is a lot of complicated legal language, so walk us through the theory. All right, so the theory is self-defense. Now, the officers would have self-defense as it applies to Kenneth Walker, but they would not have self-defense as it applies to Breonna Taylor because Breonna Taylor is not the individual who used force against them and they're responding to. There are other charges as well that really brings us to the point like this doesn't make sense. When you say self-defense, you're saying you committed the act, but there's a legal excuse. There's also assault in the first degree, which is a B felony, for when you wantonly exercise an amount of force and seriously injure that person. If you're not going to say they killed Breonna Taylor, they definitely wantonly um, disregarded her life and engaged in contact that created a grave risk of death to another and killed her. Manslaughter, you intend to injure one person. If I shoot at you, Aaron, because you shoot at me, and I hit a third person, manslaughter definitely says that's a crime. There's manslaughter, assault, so many charges that he ignored. And the only way he could have done that is by improperly charging the grand jury. Yeah, so the bottom line here is if somebody comes at me and I defend myself, that's one thing. But if I hit an innocent third party, the law of Kentucky does not cover me, Terry. That's exactly right. Under the Kentucky Penal Code, there is no self-defense argument if you are an innocent third person. And there's no question that she was an innocent third person. You heard Lanita Baker talking about the fact the officers saw she had no weapon. So she's innocent. She's just as innocent as the neighbors. And frankly, the charge that they gave to Mattingly, that should have also been as it related to Breonna Taylor as well. And frankly, all, all three of the officers. Good analysis, Terry and Brian. Let's go now to dramatic video in Ohio of a defendant making a run for it through a county courthouse. Multiple security cameras captured images of the man darting between benches and around the bar where the lawyers normally sit. At first, it was two and eventually three officers giving chase. The defendant emerged in a hallway, darted down a staircase, and got away when a rushing officer slammed headfirst into a wall and fell down the stairs. Authorities are searching for 34-year-old Nicholas Kyle Garrison in Highland County, Ohio. He was in court to be sentenced in a methamphetamine case. The injured officer was taken to the hospital for broken ribs and a possible concussion. This Pineville, Louisiana police officer who claimed he was shot while on duty is now facing his own legal trouble. His own department now says 25-year-old John Michael Goulart Jr. actually shot himself and tried to claim he was attacked. The police chief considers the shooting accidental, but since he says Goulart lied about it, Goulart is now charged with one count of malfeasance in office. A federal civil rights lawsuit is in the works after a botched police sting which caught Robert Kraft but violated the constitutional rights of dozens of people. We'll have more on that in a moment. Plus, a bizarre case involving a dismembered mother and father and a son who says he's innocent but who wants to be put to death if he's convicted. A Tennessee jury of 10 women and six men, four of them alternates, is set to hear a murder trial on Monday that we will carry live on the Law and Crime Network. 32-year-old Joel Guy Jr. is accused of stabbing his father and mother to death and then scattering their dismembered body parts around the house. His mother's head was on the stove. His father's hands were on the bathroom floor. Their torsos were soaking in barrels full of acid. 
The defendant faces a possible life sentence with a shot at parole after 51 years. That's if he's convicted. So, Brian, opening statements are Monday. The defendant is not seeking an insanity defense. The defendant, however, wrote to the judge asking for the death penalty if he's convicted, even though he says he's innocent and even though the state is not asking for the death penalty. Can you unravel what's going on with this one? I wish I Not could. Really. This is bizarre beyond belief. And, and, a, and an addendum to that note also said, this note is not supposed to be an admission of guilt uh, in any way, shape, or form. I think the, the defense attorney's got to kind of push forward and say, hey, defendants say crazy things sometimes. We just can't follow them all. I've got to defend them zealously. So, Terry, what might the defense be here? I'm going to ask you to step into Brian's shoes a little bit. Is there a defense? Well, the only defense I think he really could assert because the crime was so bizarre is insanity. But if they're not doing that, perhaps he was pushed to the brink. Perhaps he had some other mental illness. You know, I definitely think because the gruesomeness of the crime, the fact that he cut up the bodies and put them in pots and all over the house, they really need to come up with some defense that's going to help him serve time in a mental institution and not in a jail. And Terry, prosecutors have some evidence that the defendant made suspicious purchases in Louisiana where he used to live, but that's not coming into this trial. So that makes it harder for the prosecution. Absolutely. I mean, it's not coming into the trial because the search warrant wasn't specific enough. And that just goes to show you, you better be specific or you're going to lose your evidence. Exactly. Got to button up those search warrants. They have to be concrete. They have to be particular. Well, when we return, we're going to hear Florida prosecutors digging in on what he thinks was really behind decisions by multiple judges in multiple courts to toss out evidence that the prosecutor says shows an NFL owner was soliciting prostitution. A Florida prosecutor is sounding off for being forced to drop cases against 25 defendants after losing an appeal involving New England Patriots owner Robert Kraft. Kraft forced changes, or faced charges, I should say, after a sting operation at a massage parlor where authorities say some patrons were paying for sex acts. The police installed secret surveillance cameras inside private areas of the spa. But both the trial judge and appeals judges ruled the sting operation violated legitimate patrons' rights to privacy. An appeals court ruled video images of each and every defendant must be suppressed. Prosecutors say they cannot move forward against Kraft or any other suspect without the video. The risk of appealing the 4th District Court of Appeals 3-0 to zero ruling outweighs any benefit. The Attorney General was concerned, and we agreed, that the Supreme Court could expand the appellate court's ruling to ban hidden cameras uh, entirely in cases of prostitution and beyond, possibly impeding law enforcement from secretly recording human trafficking, drug trafficking, theft rings, chop shops, and other criminal enterprises. Although I'm disappointed in the result of these cases, which arose from criminal investigations in Martin County, the Jupiter Police Department did the right thing in pursuing the investigation. And I stand behind the decision to file the cases. The Orchids of Asia Day Spa was a notorious brothel in a family shopping center. Rich guys from a local country club lined up to receive sex acts throughout the day until the place closed around midnight. 31 so-called John and Jane Doe's alleged through a federal class action lawsuit that this very same prosecutor and the police violated their rights to privacy. It's clear to us that at least 27, if not all 31 plaintiffs, are non-existent. In our view, this federal lawsuit by what we consider to be phantom plaintiffs has been a tactic to pressure our office to dispose of the criminal cases. The lawsuit has demanded that we collect and turn over thousands of pages of documents and answer a ton of interrogatories that would take hundreds of hours of prosecutor and staff time. As part of this civil lawsuit, the lead, the lead plaintiff and I were court ordered into mandatory mediation. But when I showed up, the so-called lead plaintiff was nowhere to be found. All this makes us believe that the federal civil lawsuit is an abuse of the court system, and I am calling it out. 
He's got strong opinions there, Brian. I'm sure you do too. Yeah, I, I, I understand his frustration. He's used to punching against criminal defendants who don't have the power, resources, or ability to punch back. And he finally met someone who does. Uh, the higher courts agreed that they violated their rights. And I think they should need to go back to the drawing board and figure out how to do these search warrants properly because trafficking of any people is horrible and needs to be cut out, but not at the expense of other people's rights. And that's what the court decided. And Terry, here, one would think that the attention could be focused elsewhere, training, education. We had officers up on the stand in the pretrial hearing saying that they didn't understand this process of minimizing their intrusion into the legitimate privacy rights of people. Well, you would think at this point that police officers would know how to actually bring a search warrant and use the minimization rule because the penalty is you lose all of the evidence. So once again, we're seeing that the fruits of this prosecution is being thrown out of the window. We're not going to clamp down on this particular sex ring if in fact that's what it was, or we're not going to get craft because if he was soliciting prostitution, we're not going to have that either, all because the police officers were not properly trained and did not use the minimization method. So, Brian, you said you understood the frustration, but my guess is that you understand it to a degree. To a degree. Uh, because I, like everyone else, if this is a sex ring, I want it closed, but I understand to a degree because you can't violate other people's rights to do so. I appreciate the insight, Brian Buckmeyer, Terry Austin, and thanks so much for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily, where we discuss justice in America Monday through Friday. I'm Dan Abrams, and this is the Law and Crime Network. The only 24-7 network with expert legal analysis and gavel to gavel live trial coverage. Watch the Law and Crime Network today.